<laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Tharapel. I'm here with my good friend Tim Anderson, and today we are going to be discussing Rojava, SDF, uh, the Kurds, the YPG, um, as they relate to the conflict in Syria. Um, so this is uh, this is an issue that's been um, that's been talked about for quite a long time. Uh, it began in 2014 with the Battle of Kobani, and ever since then there's been a debate, particularly among the left, about what our position should be with regards to um, to the Kurdish question in Syria. Now, um, as we speak, the U.S. is uh, is continuing to occupy northern Syria, which they do on behalf of Rojava, as it's called. And um, this, again, is something that's quite controversial, especially for those of us who believe in the right of nations to self-determination. So to kick things off, um, Tim, uh, welcome. And how would you uh, how would you um, describe the role of um, of of the YPG in the over the course of the Syrian conflict? Right. So I outlined the background to this and some updates on the situation because I had a chance to visit that part of the north of Syria um, late last year in 2019. Um, now, to understand what's going on in the north, it is quite complicated. But in a sense, it's a, a chain of events that's been set in place by the intervention of the big powers in Syria. Uh, the bizarre thing is that uh, you look at the Western media and as it's faithfully recorded in Wikipedia, you'll think there's a Syrian civil war going on, even though we have three foreign armies occupying Syria at the moment. Um, and all of the rest of the conflict there is to do with the proxies of those armies. And the YPG, which the US renamed the SDF in 2015, which, by the way, brought about a shift in the way the Western media reported uh, that pretty much the same group um, had became another proxy effectively for the US and is still one of their proxies in northeast Syria and to some extent in eastern Syria. Although, um, as I found out when I was visiting Mumbij and Kobani last year, um, their presence in the north is rather flimsy and not uh, not contiguous at all. So the maps you see uh, with big yellow sort of areas across the north of Syria and down the east of Syria do not represent any real um, Kurdish influence or SDF, YPG uh, influence, except in the sense that they're nominal. Mm. Okay, I mean, you you mentioned that um, that uh, they've they've become proxies of the United States. Of course, in response to that, um, uh, a lot of people would say, especially people on on the left, would respond by saying, "Well, you're denying the agency of the YPG." How would you respond to that? You see, in the Syrian context, Syria is a country that's historically been made up of minorities. Right now. Uh, and indeed, minorities were attracted to Syria, Christian minorities, Alawi minorities, Druze minorities, specifically take advantage of the fact that it's been an inclusive constitutional system. Whatever else you want to say about the Syrian state, it's committed to a pluralist sort of system, as opposed to the Islamist um, approach, um, you know, whether it's from Erdogan or whether it's from the Saudis. So the thing about the Kurdish um, and the claims of Kurdish self-determination or the Kurdish right to a homeland in Syria uh, have, have several major problems. The first one is this is no indigenous uh, claim for the return of ancestral lands because the Kurds are one of a number of minorities that occupy the north of Syria. And I'll put aside the argument uh, that some people make about their nomadic status and so on. It's true historically the Kurds came more from Mesopotamia, Iraq and, and Iran. But nevertheless, the biggest group of Kurds these days is in Turkey and they do cross uh, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, the smallest group which is in Syria. Now, the claim for a separatist Kurdish statelet, or as it's called Rojava, in Syria is really something that dates from modern day Turkey and we're under the influence of Turkey. And we know historically that the Kurdish presence in, as a minority in Syria, has been divided into three factions, basically. They, they've been very strong in the uh, the nationalist or um, pluralist um, Syrian approach. The al Shakli, for example, was a prime minister of the Syrian Social National Party in Syria. Um, there's a strong current, uh, Kurdish current there. We go back uh, centuries to Saladin, who he wasn't a Kurdish separatist. He was a, you know, a caliph of a much greater uh, mm. entity there. 
uh, in more recent times, uh, Sheikh Mohammed al Bouti, who's also buried in the Al Umayyad Mosque with uh, next to uh, Saladin, um, was also a famous Kurd, but not a not a sectarian Kurd or not a separatist Kurd. And so the uh, the historians that have looked at mm. the presence in Syria have spoken of it in three lots. One is the the pan Syrian group. The other one is the communists, because the Kurds had a very strong presence in the communist parties in Syria too. And the third one is a separatist, um, uh, separatist Kurdish uh, nationalist idea there. Now that, of course, and here's the other problem, has been overdetermined by the Turkish presence. Um, mm. That is to say, you've got something like 20 million Kurds in Turkey, and you've got about one and a half million Kurds in Syria. And so what Erdogan says for all of his deceit and his maneuvers and so on, what he says about the YPG being effectively a branch of the of the PKK in Turkey is effectively true. And Ocalan, the leader of the, the PKK, who is also effectively the nominal leader of the Kurds in northern Syria, and they, they're quite happy to pose with big pictures of him and they post big pictures of him in their areas. Uh, he said this, um, he had refuge in Syria, by the way, at one stage, back until, until the late 90s, when Syria signed an accord with, uh, with Turkey, Ocalan said that most of the Kurds of Syria were refugees and migrants from Turkey and they would benefit from returning there. Mm, so mm. we need to understand the Kurdish nationalist uh, current, one of three currents in the Kurdish minority in Syria, um, has always been dominated by Turkey. The first Kurdish nationalist party set up was by exiled Turks and uh, the they were replaced by exiled Turks. So now it's the same more or less situation. Rojava effectively is a step towards a Kurdish state in Turkey. That's the big game, basically. So, so it's compromise in the sense that they're not the only minority there. They, of course, um, well, here's an interesting thing. Before the YPG effectively was converted into the SDF by the US in 2015, we had Western media, including Amnesty International, which is effectively a Western agency, um, criticizing the YPG for ethnic cleansing of mm. the Christians, for example, in uh, Kamishli and, uh, and Mambij, in those parts of the north there, where they still have some nominal control under a strange sort of uh, arrangement with the Russians and the Syrians. Um, but, uh, you know, they didn't, really, they didn't really change in substance, basically, in, in, terms of their, uh, in terms of their project. Now, of course, with the fact that the Trump occupation forces having partially withdrawn from parts of northern Syria, we see a really strange development. That is to say, the areas from, that is to say, the US pulled back into the northeast of Syria and abandoned that strip in the north of Syria with Mumbij, Kobani and so on. I was able to travel from to Mumbij and to Kobani late last year with the Syrian Arab army and with also permission from the SDF who are still dominated by Kurds effectively, but they still have this dream of a Rojava, but they are now cooperating with the Russians and the Syrians because they're far too weak to be able to resist Erdogan and, and all the proxies that Erdogan's brought to bear in that, in that northern part of Syria. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I noticed that you mentioned uh, that it's actually, that there's other minorities there as well. So it's very difficult to, to carve out a separate state, um, which ends up being a state that represents Kurdish hegemony. Um, and then justify that on the grounds of self-determination if you're then trampling on the rights of the other uh, ethnic groups that live there. So there's also Arabs and Assyrians. And the Assyrians in particular, I think it's important to note, were the majority in the city of Karmishli up until the 1980s. The only reason the Kurds ended up demographically dominating uh, northern Syria is because they came as refugees, as you also mentioned, from Turkey. Um, so often you hear people say that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, but the great irony is that if you go to northern Syria, there are very few mountains there because they're, of course, referring to the Zagros Mountains, which is the, the homeland of the Kurdish people. And I think this speaks to, um, to, I think, difficulties that a lot of people have in understanding uh, the Kurdish situation because the automatic assumption is one of, of Kurdish victimhood, that Kurds have just been victimized throughout history. But as you mentioned, that's not true. I mean, throughout history, they have been conquerors, if anything. Well, they, um, have, so. they have a different history in Turkey. And I think the, the, the Syrian situation needs to be seen in that light, that when um, 
the Kurds uh, occupied some important positions in the Ottoman Empire. Actually, uh, there was a there was a significant section of um, well-educated Kurds who were through the Ottoman Empire. But when the Turkish state was created in the early 20th century, about 200 years ago, after the First World War, or during and after the First World War, um, effectively there was a nationalist regime set in place which didn't provide uh, inclusion of Kurdish language, for example. So there was a, a Kurdish rebellion against the, the state set up by Ataturk there. And many of them sought refuge after their first failed um, rebellion in 1925 in Syria. They were accepted into Syria um, they were given refuge in Syria, as Ocalan himself in the 1990s was given refuge in Syria from Turkey. You know, so um, that history is important. That there was and Syria. Syria supported the PKK from 1980 to 1998. That's right. Remember. When that, that agreement it was called the um, um, what's the name of it? The um, when Ocalan was forced to leave um, the. Uh, I done an agreement with Turkey, basically, that they um, it was a deal that was done by the late President Hafez al-Assad and uh, and the Turkish government at that time. So the the conditions that led to the Kurdish rebellion in Turkey were significantly different to Syria. Um, in Syria, um, there was a the, the great majority of Kurds in Syria accepted the pluralist state. Effectively, as I said, some of them were pan-Syrian, some of them were communist, and there was a minority dominated by Turkish exiles in, in Turkey, in, in Syria, certainly. But um, when I managed to visit Kobani in the north there, Kobani or Ain al Arab is a Syrian town on the border of Turkey, right on the border of Turkey. Um, it's not that big. There's about maybe 40,000 people there, perhaps less. And because there was a lot of fighting with ISIS, with Daesh there, um, a lot of people were driven out and, and people have come back. The result is that in that town, there is probably a majority Kurds and there's a fairly strong Kurdish administration of that town. So they took us to, uh, I asked them to, to take us to a, a hospital and um, a school. And in the school, they'd reverted the education to, they'd rejected the idea of teaching Arab and their, as, a, as a majority language, that their main language of instruction in that school was uh, Kurdish, one of the Kurdish languages. Mm. And then there was a minority, I think they said it was like 20% Arabic and 20% English. So they they created their own curriculum there, basically. And in the hospital, similarly, they um, said that they, obviously, they got no help from Ankara. They got no help from Turkey. And I said, what about Damascus? He said, we don't get it and we don't want it. So they were very fiercely trying to assert their independence in that little town. But it's a small town. It's a small town. And in the rest of that region, um, the Syrian government is indeed financing schools and hospitals and so on. And what was even more striking, I didn't realise the extent of this, in Mumbij, which is a far bigger town, well over half a million people, so much more than 10 times bigger than, than Kobani, um, the SDF had maintained an administrative control there um, because the Syrians and the Russians allied with them want to leave the status quo for the time being, basically. But the, some of the members of the, of the council there came to us and were complaining, the Mumbij council were complaining that the, there were some terrible repression going on there and the Kurdish population of Mumbij is tiny, really, really tiny. They said either one or two villages in uh, Mumbij was Kurdish. So in other words, even though the YPG slash SDF claims to have liberated uh, Mumbij from Daesh, from ISIS, of course, in many respects, the US was backing up the SDF to replace another proxy, which was ISIS, basically. We know mm. that Turkey and the US were supporting Daesh to precisely to weaken Damascus, as their intelligence report said back in the early days of the war. So you have this strange contradiction where there are a couple of places like Kobani or Ain al Arab where there is a, Turkey, a, a Kurdish administration with a Kurdish nationalist agenda there, but really, um, you know, without any substantial support in terms of, you know, all of the states of the region are against them, except Israel. We'll come to that later on. Mm -hmm. But all of the states of the region are against them. Um, and they're getting much less of a flow of money from the Americans since the, the US troops pulled back from northern Syria to the northeastern Syria across to Hasaka, where there's still a few hundred US troops there playing ducks and drakes with the, with the Russian patrols over there. But in, in some of those other parts, particularly Mumbij, which I didn't realise how big a town it was, it's a very, 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 very big city now. And people have been driven out and come back into there too. 
there's a tiny minority. You could say the same in Raqqa too, where it's, it's said, you look at the maps and they say, well, as SDF, you know, control Raqqa, there's hardly any Kurds in Raqqa at all, let alone in Deir Ezzur, you know. So those maps that show this yellow going across the north and down the east, there's only a few pockets there. Like <laughs> it's Barney mostly Island. desert. It's I think people desert. get confused by it because it's mostly desert, yeah. But Mambish is a big city and Raqqa is a big city and Deir Ezzur, you know, so you have some big cities there in a lot of towns and they are not a majority in mm. those regions at all. In fact, they're a tiny minority in, in many of the parts. But the Syrian army, in their patience, has allowed that status quo to remain there against some opposition, I might say. These council people were saying there's some terrible things going on with prisoners there. Indeed, I was sitting in a room with some Syrian officers and some Kurdish officers for a few, for about two hours, waiting to get permission to travel from Mumbij to Kobani. And uh, it was an interesting discussion, but, um, you know, the, 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 it's good natured because they're fighting together against Erdogan's gangs, who are sometimes brought across from Idlib there. And they have a common enemy in these Islamist groups, basically, for now, but they're fighting for different causes. The the SDF Kurds are still um, fighting for this idea of Kurdistan or Java, and the Syrian army is fighting for a pluralist, inclusive Syria. But they, um, you know, they they were having this lighthearted banter about, you know, all the prisoners you've got and um, all the people you've got in prison and the, the, the Kurdish guys who are fairly young officers were saying, oh, they're re-education camps, really, you know. So, mm -hmm. But right, uh, right. there's a darker side to that story too. Well, um, what did you what did you hear from that meeting? Because I remember you mentioning um, mentioning this before. Um, what did you what sense did you get about the, the the composition of the YPG's military ranks? So, do you know how many of them are actually from Syria? How many of them are from other parts of the Middle East? I asked one. Uh, I asked one of the two men that was there. He, maybe he's thirty years old or early thirties, something like that. Whereas the three Syrian colonels were all because the Syrian army is sort of you know ranked with age and experience and so on. They were all late forties, fifties, something like that. These two Kurdish officers, they call themselves comrades. That they say there's no ranks. They do have a general. They have the bosses, but they claim that they've all got the same rank. Um, I asked one of them who was who was sharing some information with me, like sharing some videos of, of the, the other side and so on. I said, where do you come from? And uh, and he said, I'm from all over. And everyone just had a little, mm. had a little giggle, you know. So most likely he was Turkish, but but who knows? But they, they, they're not very, yeah. they, they don't really want to open that. One, one thing I found very interesting was that I said to them, because the video that this guy showed me um, was of... Um, some one of the gangs in in not too far away with the three red star flag you know so what used to be called the free syrian army and whatever name they had there i forget north of Ain Alissa, north of north of that spot there they were on strike um and they wanted to go back to idlib <laughs> these people in other words erdogan had ported them across from idlib across you know a few hundred kilometers across to uh north of Ain Alissa, Ain Alissa, and they were on strike there and so I, uh, he, was, he passed that on to me through WhatsApp, you know, and I was looking at the video there. Um, and uh, I said to them, and this was more or less to the, the Kurds and the, and the Syrian army people, I said, listen, what's the difference between this free army people and Jabhat al-Nusra, you know, or HTS? Mm -hmm. And all of them said nothing. There's no difference. I said, what, mm -hmm. about, what about Nusra and Daesh? I said, no difference at all. I said, what about in the composition of you know, foreign fighters and Syrians, no difference at all. All of them agreed. The, the SDF people and the Syrian army people agreed. There wasn't any Russians there. They were outside. They agreed. They said, they said, listen, it's just a money game. If someone's paying more, they'll go to Daesh, they'll go to mm -hmm. Nusra, to the free army. It's just a money game. And they've seen them move around a lot. Now, one interesting thing is <clears throat> um, you would see something similar, according to the Syrian army people, with the SDF, that is to say, when the US pulled out of that northern part of Syria into northeast, into Hasaka, there's much less money and armed support and so on like that. So the foreign collaborators, or let's say the people from other countries, all disappeared. The money dried up, the weapons dried up, and it came back to more local people. And I'm getting back to the point of your question before, was that the US was trying to cover up the fact that uh, I remember there was a report, I think it was four years ago, 2016, they said the Mumbij Military Council, which still exists, it's a like 
but now it's Russian Syrian and, and, and SDF, um, was only 40% Kurd, they claim. Now, it's not clear that that's true, but the Syrians suggest that's not the case, that it was always, the SDF was always dominated by Kurds, but they tried to hide it because Mumbij in particular is overwhelmingly major, majority Arab people, basically. They, yeah. they can't even try to start schools with the Kurdish language there because all the families there are Arab speakers and um, not all of them, but, you know, the great majority of them, basically. So they haven't got that same agenda. The, 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 the Americans have tried to hide that, but uh, Mumbij in particular, but you'd say the same about Raqqa and Derizur, uh, there's in, almost insignificant Kurdish presence there. Mm -hmm. But the SDF has always been had that motivation because it, driven by the Turkish leadership and supported by the US. Of course, the US was very skillful in a way. They, they knew that they were drawing Erdogan into this trap there. There was this big tension between the US and, and Erdogan over, the, over northern Syria, which they talked about for a while. But it was very clever in a way because they, Erdogan, for all his manipulations and ambitions, uh, he's right when he says that this Rojava statelet is a threat to Turkey in the sense that it represents mm -hmm. a branch of the PKK and therefore, um, you know, his justification. Well, let's say the support that he has in Turkey for um, addressing that supposed threat to Turkish uh, nationalism is, uh, is, is, has some substance. Hmm. I mean, the, uh, the other problem here is that it could also be a way for Turkey to offload its uh, Kurdish problem. So in, instead of having a, a state within Turkey, they can say, well, if you want a separate Kurdish ethno state, you can have one in Syria. So anyone who's keen on that, just go to Syria. Um, and that's why I think like why I'm really, really concerned about um, about what percentage of the YPG's fighting ranks are actually from Syria, because if you have, um, you know, uh, an army that that claims that they need to separate from Syria on the grounds that they faced some terrible oppression at the hands of the Syrian government, but then the majority of its fighting forces are not even Syrian in the sense, in the sense that they never lived under the Syrian government, then that's completely hypocritical. It's actually just a form of colonization. Well, from the Kurdish point of view, they don't, they try to say this doesn't matter, of course. Mm -hmm. you know? The problem is you've got more Kurds in Turkey than there are Syrians in Syria at the moment, you know. So, uh, and indeed, one of the uh, one of the um, uh, criticisms made of Damascus is that, you know, they had all these stateless people and they weren't giving them proper citizenship, or they were actual, you know, emigrants from Turkey, basically. Whether they were whatever the purpose of their emigration was, but they were whether they were refugees from the the repression, the the, the genuine repression that was going on. Um, you know, in the name of fighting the, the Kurdish groups, of course, they were um, arresting and jailing lots and lots of civilians who, who were sympathetic with, uh, with the PKK in Turkey. So a lot of them came to Syria. And you would find, if you look back over the last few years in Syria, there has been actually, uh, and I think in the early years of the conflict too, I think you pointed out at one stage that quite a lot of um, uh, stateless Kurds in northern Syria were given Syrian citizenship early on. They were, they, yeah. They didn't, they didn't want to do it like have an open uh, an open checkbook there because what you you could have millions you know there and i think from erdogan's point of view i don't really think that first proposition you mentioned is, is that viable because erdogan's um you know fear and i think it has some basis to it is that roger would simply be a staging point for yeah, for yeah. And you know you would have a million and a half but you would have if they had some status as a statelet and some sort of international protection whatever you know it would be a staging post for uh, more incursions in Turkey. And so the national side of Turkish politics is not going to, unless you had a Turkish government that came along and, you know, proposed some sort of better social integration of, of, of Kurdish Turks, <laughs> you, would have, um, you would have a staging point for um, separatism within Turkey. Yeah, yeah. Um, up until 1962, like, because you mentioned... Um uh, the, the citizenship question. I believe that up until 1962, Kurds were granted citizenship. And then the waves that came after, uh, especially in the 1980s, uh, because of the, the PKK insurgency inside Turkey, they were not given citizenship because the understanding was that they were being given refuge by the Syrian government and that their real struggle was in Turkey, that the Syrian government would support the PKK to, yeah. to fight for their rights inside Turkey. Now, of course, when that, when that went sour, when the, when the PKK insurgency started to lose in the 90s, that support was pulled, right? But 
the 300,000 stateless Kurds that, um, that remained in Syria were actually granted citizenship in April 2011. Um, they made that demand very, very soon after the protest began. And the Syrian government responded to it by saying, yep, okay, sure, we'll give you citizenship. They gave them citizenship in April 2011. Um, and then they kind of had de facto autonomy. It wasn't legal autonomy. It's not like the Syrian government said, here, you know, you have autonomy. But because the Syrian army was focused on fighting battles in the rest of Syria, and because uh, they saw the YPG as having a common interest in keeping their territories in the border free from, uh, from Islamist militias that were coming over the border from Turkey, they had a kind of de facto military cooperation going on for yeah, they gave them most weapons. of the war. The Syrian army gave them weapons, yeah, from, yeah. Sir, from 2012 at least. I'm not sure when it, exactly when it began, for at least from 2012, when there was that big push into Aleppo and northern Syria there from Turkey, um, until the US created this SDF in 2015. So you've got a period there where you're right, there was a de facto sort of, and, and even regions of, regions of Aleppo City, for example, which were, they set up as no-go zones for the Syrian army, for example, and uh, notoriously after in later on, which was, um, you know, the, the price of excluding the Syrian army was that Erdogan effectively took over Afrin mm, and mm. is, you know, um, Turkish currency, Turkish uh, schools, you know, Turkish language, all of those things are going full steam ahead because the separatist ambitions there, they weren't able to defend what they had claimed. Um, so then, of course, once the Americans came into the picture, of course, then things changed because then they were able to, the SDF was able to claim victories against Daesh, which appeared very impressive. But as you know, um, some of those, like in Raqqa, for example, uh, it was uh, very limited fighting. Considering the bitter fighting that was going on between the Syrian army and Daesh in Deir Ezzur, for example, over some years, um, you know, the, the, the liberation of Raqqa was really effectively, like with Mambij, it was like the replacement of one US proxy with another. And of course, while there has indeed been genuine conflict between the groups, because there's rivalry, um, Nevertheless, you know, it was uh, it was not at all the scale of fighting that you saw when the Syrian army was was fighting Daesh, basically. And well, I mean, the, the 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 race to Raqqa, which resulted in in the U.S. and the SDF taking over the city, involved large scale aerial bombardment. Like, I don't think there's been a single city in, in Syria that's experienced that much bombardment uh, in order to take it back. Whenever the Syrian government fights to take back its own uh, cities, it's it's much more willing to lose the lives of its soldiers rather than simply carpet bomb the carpet bomb the area and take it over. Whereas well, I believe um, the Russians right. compared right. the the campaign in Raqqa to like Dresden. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. Like, contrary to the propaganda, um, there wasn't scorched earth carpet bombing carried out by the Syrians because they knew whether it was in East Ghouta or in Aleppo or wherever else. They, even though the, 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 the ground fighting ended up, you know, destroying a lot of areas, but they knew that had, were there simply, were, did they disregard, you know, the, the other people who were living in those zones, um, it would be much more bitter legacy to deal with later on because the Syrian government, unlike the US government, is responsible for the consequences mm. of what it does. And so therefore they... And didn't... oftentimes the, the soldiers of the Syrian army are fighting they know that their own family members are inside the cities. And so they're going to be extra careful. They'd much rather lose their own lives than kill their own family members, whereas that's a worry that the United States doesn't have. Or even, for example, for that matter, the SDF. If the SDF is largely comprised of, uh, of, of uh, Kurdish immigrants from other countries like Turkey, Iran and Iraq, then they're not going to care about the people living inside Raqqa because they don't have any relatives inside Raqqa. They've got no skin in the game. It's always the case with foreign interventions. It's the same thing, you know, in Vietnam, in Syria, it's the same thing. The foreign army will never have any sense of responsibility um, before we get to talking about questions of humanity. But there is no responsibility. There is little understanding, you know, and, and you're right about the, the bombardment of Raqqa. It's, um, it's an appalling situation. And also, if notice, by the way, to update that situation is that the UN, uh, sorry, the US and Britain and France will not allow UNESCO, for example, to restore Syrian cities, whether it's Raqqa or, or Palmyra or Aleppo, even though Palmyra and Aleppo are World Heritage sites, they will not allow UN money to 
because they haven't got the outcome that they wanted in Syria, they won't allow UN money to be used for reconstruction, even of World Heritage Sites. Whereas in Mosul, for example, in Iraq, which was also terribly trashed in, in a similar sort of fashion, basically, um, you know, without regard for the lives of civilians and simply to remove a proxy that the U itself and US itself had created through the Saudis, basically. Um, there is UNESCO money in, in Mosul, and Mosul is not World well Heritage. Mosul is not even that much of an old city. Like, it's not really a, it doesn't well, go back to antiquity to the same. Most deserve to be re reconstructed. But if you talk about UNESCO, which supervises World Heritage areas, Palmyra and Aleppo are World Heritage old areas. Nothing going in there from UNESCO. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this, this really, uh, I think one of the most disappointing things for me is the way that the left has responded to this because, um, you know, on the one side, from 2011 to around 2014, the the, the majority of the left, I mean, obviously there, there was a large dissident faction. I, I believe that that our side of the conflict, our side of the, the, the struggle within the left in the first world, within Australia, within the other Anglo countries, I believe that our side eventually won the debate. Um, but up until then, the dominant factions within the left from let's say 2011 to 2014, were supporting the so-called revolution led by the Free Syrian Army, and they were making the argument that, you know, whatever, um, you know, Islamist components um, or Al Qaeda, ISIS components, they were marginal. That it's actually a secular democratic rebellion. And then in 2014, all of a sudden, a, a faction of this left decided to support the YPG, right? And it was. It came out of nowhere, really, um, that you started to see, for example, David Graeber and Murray Bookchin saying that this is, you know, a real revolution. It's an anarcho-syndicalist feminist, um, uh, all of the different isms that you can attach to to make it sound progressive. I think um, Antifa went over there to fight for the Kurds. Yeah, yeah, Antifa was over there setting up, you know, autonomy and, you know, all, all of that was, was basically happening. But at the same time, I believe that, that the purpose of this, the reason why a certain faction of the Western left got, um, got suckered into supporting this Rojava project was to give cover to what would eventually become the U.S. occupation of northern Syria. Would you like to speak to that? Yes, well, um, just to sort of do the, the counterfactual to that to start with, um, because um, Trump, and I think uh, whatever else you would say about Bolton's recent book, which is critical of Trump, and it's full of lies. You know, you couldn't rely, you couldn't rely on anything he says. But one thing that comes across is he he, he seems to confirm that Trump did actually want to get out of Syria and Afghanistan, but had no plan to do so, and effectively got rolled by the other people in the in the U.S. state, you know, in the Pentagon and whatever, including Bolton himself, you know, who's the hero of his own story. But so in the course of that. Um, Trump did make a partial withdrawal. You know, he tried to withdraw, he got attacked, and then he stopped and said, we'll stay there and keep the oil for ourselves and so on. What it meant was that the US presence in northern Syria shifted from central and, and uh, north central and northeastern Syria to northeastern Syria, across to Hasaka, where there's now a bit of, um, you know, rivalry between the Russian and the, um, and the US patrols over there. But effectively, they're gone from north central Syria. So in that situation, it's interesting to see the changes that happened to the SDF there. And according to the Syrian sources there, um, and it's it's fairly apparent, they the SDF in north central Syria, like Mumbij and Kobani, they have much less resources without the US there with weapons and money in particular, because the US was providing uh, you know four wheel drives and all sorts of goodies while they were while in the areas that they were in. Um, they're gone from, from north central Syria, which is under a joint Russian Syrian army SDF, nominal SDF control, but effectively the Russians and the Syrians run the place. Mumbij, for example, oh, here's an interesting thing. Mm. I was waiting, I was waiting for a couple of hours to get permission to go from Mumbij to Kobani. And uh, in that couple of hours, um, uh, the guy I was with, I was with a Syrian journalist and and uh, you know, he was a little bit pessimistic about whether I was going to get permission to interview some senior military people and so on. But he suggested in the meantime, anyway, why don't we just ask one of these colonels to show us where we are? So, you know, to start getting a, an informal briefing if we weren't getting a formal briefing, formal military briefing. So that one of the, they were friendly enough and we were, you know, drinking their coffee and they were wanting to share food with us and everything. Typical hospitable Syrians. So the guy goes and rolls out a military map you know, with all of the, 
all of the Syrian and enemy um, placements marked on the map, you know, what, what used to be one of the most secret of all sort of military, um, you know, operations. But um, mm. these days, like with drones and so on, I guess it's less secret anyway. I didn't take any pictures of the map. But what I did notice was that the town of Mumbij, which we were just on the outskirts of, had six armoured groups. I don't know what you call them. They're not divisions. Six armoured groups with tanks and artillery and so on defending the city of Mumbij. Mm -hmm. which was being run by the SDF, you know. But it was the SAA armour that was in the front line against yeah, the Yeah, exactly. And the Turks. Uh, uh, you know? so, yeah. so, in other words, the, in a very short space of time, the SDF in that part of Syria, leaving aside the northeast for the moment, was utterly dependent for its protection from being slaughtered by the Turkish gangs and you know, backed up by the Turkish army on Russian and Sy Syrian armour. By the evil Assad regime. <laughs> the evil Assad regime was effectively protecting the SDF nominally run large city of Mumbij, basically. That was mm -hmm. a, a major a major protection point. You could see all the way along. I mean, the, 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 the sad thing about the map was you could see also that the Turkish forces and, and the Turkish back gangs, I mean, Erdogan was using the, you know, the, the Islamist gang, which he brought some of them across from uh, Idlib at that time, just now, like he sent a number of them from that part of the world across to Libya. Uh, it was a, quite a long front, you know, maybe 200 kilometres of territory cutting, um, you know, six to 10 kilometres or 50, up to 15 kilometres inside Syrian territory there and attacking some of the parts within Syria. Fortunately, they didn't attack Kobani. I was rather surprised by that, actually. When we were in Kobani, which is right on the border, there was no attacks on Kobani itself, but they were attacking Ain Alissa, which was 15, 20 kilometres inside, you know, I think strategically to cut, try and cut that M4 highway that goes across there. They wanted to, uh, Erdogan wanted to carve up parts of northern Syria, mm. so make it, but, you know, he didn't want a full-scale confrontation with the Russians and the Syrians, basically, rather preferring for the gangs, you know, the mercenaries. But he can he can waste a lot of mercenaries' lives. He doesn't care about them, basically, um, them going in and doing the incursions to try and grab hold of. And I think they're still trying to grab hold of Ayn al there. But anyway, the point I was trying to make in response to your question was that the the the, the SDF group, have lost a lot of influence when the Americans' direct presence was removed. Mm, mm. And also, they lost a lot of any of the foreign collaborators who were in there, like, you know, the people from the US or whatever, or the Antifa people or whoever it was. Um, those people went too. The money ran out, the protection ran out, and they were gone too. So it fell back onto the Turkish-Syrian. There are Syrian Kurds in there too, but the Turkish and Syrian alliance that effectively makes up the core of the, of the SDF there, they were... They were stripped of a lot of that foreign uh, support as well as the, the U.S. money and, and weapons. Yeah, and um, this is like you know when I when I open with the question about um, about whether they're proxies or not. Um, the fact is that you know the the U.S. Ah, um, oh, that's right. Uh, back when um, uh, back when the U.S. was uh, was far more committed to supporting them. So from 2014 onwards. Um, this is actually this is actually reported um, in in the mainstream press. At Washington's request, we agreed. This is let me let me uh, start again. So this is according to um, to one of the SDF uh, commanders, and he says at Washington's request, we agreed to withdraw our heavy weapons from the border area with Turkey, destroy our defensive fortifications, and pull back our most seasoned fighters. Turkey would never attack us so long as the U.S. government was true to its word with us. So they basically just followed the orders of the United States. The United States has said, basically said to them, get rid of your defensive fortifications, we'll protect you. And then the United States allowed the Turks to invade. So they've allowed themselves to, they've gotten themselves into a really, um, you know, awful position where they're relying on, on, on this foreign um, uh, entity that's not really that's not really reliable in the same way that the Syrian government would be. The Syrian government has an interest in protecting its border with Turkey. Um, but the difference there is that the Syrian government, I think because they wanted to bolster their secessionist ambitions against Syria, that's the reason why they asked the United States to intervene on their behalf. Yeah, no, the US made use of, you know, a weak point, which was that there was this historical secessionist movement driven from Turkey. And uh, they knew that they could use that against Damascus, basically. And then when it became a conflict with Turkey, in a sense, they skillfully used it to try and, uh, to try and uh, you know, wedge 
wedge the wedge the Kurds against Turkey and threaten. Trump was threatening then that um, that you know if if Erdogan did something against the Kurds, they'd come back and so on. But um, what you've ended up with is that the U.S. both the U.S. and Turkey are on a losing gambit, effectively. You know, Erdogan still nominally has this pretensions to control, to cut out a slice, uh, control a slice of northern Syria. I, th I, I doubt that he's ever going to have any um, real reach into eastern Syria. You know, they say it's nominally S uh, SDF only because the US is still in Hasakar and Deir Zor, basically. But certainly northern, northern Syria, Erdogan has ambitions to try and maintain a slice of Idlib and Afrin and and some of those other areas. He would like to hang on to those sorts of areas and repopulate them with, um, you know, people that are loyal to his Muslim Brotherhood regime, basically. And unfortunately, in a long war, the great vulnerability there is that they're using Turkish currency. The kids, some of the kids are learning are learning Turkish. And in mm, Kobani, mm. Okay, in Kobani, they're learning uh, small groups, learning, learning Kurdish language. But um, there's a great Turkification, you know, of, of large slices of of northern Syria, starting with Idlib, but including some of the other areas. And that's the problem. I mean, children are an important objective in a long war. And a number of people in Syria, one in, intelligence general was making this point, you know, that, 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 that they could get to people through their minds, you know, if they can, can teach the kids Turkish language and teach them to be fanatical Islamists and so on, then, you know, they're doing great damage to the country. And I think the Syrian leaders have made this point from the very beginning too, you know, that the, the psychology of a long war is the more difficult thing to deal with. Indeed, indeed. The, the, I mean, the, the possibility of, um, of them taking over northern Syria, um, whether it's like, I mean, if northern Syria were to, were to cease being a part of being under the control of the central government in Damascus, it would also mean that Damascus loses access to the to the small oil resources that it has. So I think that's the other um, factor that people miss. I mean, yeah, you know, Trump said, you know, we're in there, we're going to take the oil. People think that it's something that the United States will benefit from. But that part of Syria has very little oil. Really, it's about depriving the rest of Syria of the oil that it needs. And um, just about uh, the role that the YPG has played, um, do you remember the, the report that came out which said that um, the SDF had uh, started selling oil directly to Israel? Well, I think that, you know, that was by Turkey, wasn't it? So you yeah, had, yeah. You had a, um, now, as I recall, of course, Daesh was, ISIS was selling oil into Turkey and it was going to Israel that way. There was also a relationship that Erdogan had with the Iraqi um, northern Kurds, you know, the Barzani Kurds there, basically, um, which, by the way, is an interesting parallel, you know, because there's a federal system in, in Iraq, um, you have a, you know, a type of oil economy in that Kurdistan region of Iraq there. But ordinary people don't get that oil. When you have an oil economy, it doesn't filter, it doesn't, oil trickles down much less than anything else, basically. Some little groups get control of it. But there was, uh, you know, a dirty business going along between the Barzani administration in northern Iraq and Turkey there. Now, the SDF itself, I doubt that they're actually controlling any significant oil. Um, Syria has recovered some of its oil fields in, in uh, Hasaka. Some okay. of it, not yeah. all of it, some of it. And some of it in Deir Zur, but not all of it. You know, a number of fields on the on the east side of the Euphrates are are still controlled by the U.S. So, you're right to say that there's no real, there's no great advantage in terms of um, in terms of actual oil or revenue to the U.S. And and Trump saying that you know the vulgar expression, which only sort of underlined the illegality of what he was doing. In in reality, it was a sock to the people that actually. Um, blocked him from a complete withdrawal from Syria. I think mm, we, mm, we can I agree. With that. I think he was. I think he was talking about Lindsey Graham at that time or whatever. But you know, Bolton and all these other people, so a number of the people in the Pentagon knew that the big game in the Middle East was not really uh, wasn't about the fact that they were losing a war in in Syria. Is they didn't want to lose the whole region and lose influence to Iran. In other words, to weaken Israel. So. The great game, or the the, the or the, the the middle range game, let's say in the Middle East, was something that people like Bolton and the Pentagon people and Lindsey Graham are all conscious of. You know that they 
uh, if they see, if they withdraw from Iraq, if they withdraw from Syria, if they withdraw from Afghanistan, that you'll have a very powerful coalition led by Iran, which is the biggest independent state in the region. And that will be to the disadvantage of the Saudis and to, and to Israel. So that's mm -hmm. why they keep these wars going on, even though they think that they're losing. And, and uh, you know, Bolton, um, for all his faults, I think he sort of makes that point sort of fairly clearly in, in his book. You, you can't really stomach reading too much of it because it's so self-serving and there is lies built on top of lies. But the obsession with Iran, you know, which is all mm. to do with Iran's the big independent player that supports the resistance in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Palestine. That's why they hate it, basically. It's nothing to do with their religion or they or they make women wear hijabs or anything like that. It's because they are... Blocking US ambitions in every country ambitions. that they've tried to subjugate. And yeah. Got, and and, and I, remember, I remember these, these debates happening back in December 2018. So um, uh, December 2018 was, was the first time that, um, that Trump indicated that he wanted to withdraw from Syria. And there was there was a lot of articles coming out from the liberal establishment media saying we should stay, you know, otherwise we're going to be subjecting the the Kurds of northern Syria to a Turkish back genocide, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the strangest things from that episode that really didn't get anywhere near as much um, attention as it should have is that the Kurdish SDF, they said that if the US withdraws, then they may need to release 3,200 captured ISIS fighters so that their personnel can be shifted to frontline positions against Turkey. Mm. Now, if you're if you're worried about ISIS fighters, right, then why would you release them in order to fight against the Turkish government when you know that these ISIS fighters are on the same side as Turkey? Why wouldn't you rather just hand them over to the Syrian government? Mm. And the the only answer that I can really think about is that they wanted to, they probably thought, okay, well, if the US leaves and, and ISIS comes back, then that'll be a reason for getting the United States to come back um, and enter Syria. And it all makes sense when you consider the, the, the arguments that have been used to justify Kurdish secessionism in northern Syria. Because whenever you speak to people who um, represent or claim to represent the Kurdish cause, really the cause of the YPG in Syria, I've always noticed that the one form of solidarity that they would never offer um, uh, offer to to their to to the YPG in Syria is demanding that foreign countries stop arming and supporting and funding the the same militias that they were fighting against with the Syrian government. So, for example, why wouldn't you? So, for example, you see a lot of pro YPG groups here in Australia. I ask them, well, how come you've never called for the for for the for the arming and the funding of groups like the Free Syrian Army and the Al Qaeda militias to stop. You've never called for that. You've only ever called for the U.S. to intervene to save you from from the same militias that you're happy to see take over the rest of Syria. Well, unfortunately, that was Chomsky's line too, wasn't it? Chomsky, I think, yeah. re repeated his uh, claims of 2011. You know, in relation to the Kurds, didn't he? He was actually uh, argued specifically for intervention. But look, um, I don't know whether the SDF itself or, let's say, the Kurdish separatists um, are all, or their followers are all as Machiavellian about um, what their overall objective is. But I think you can only understand it by going back to the, the you know, the organ grinder and not the monkeys, basically, that the US um, saw the Kurds as a convenient tool bear. Now, it's you can't really say that there's much love lost between um, Kurds and Daesh because although there are... You know there are some there are Kurds within Daesh, and there are and a lot of Kurds. Uh, most Kurds are Muslim, Sunni Muslim. But um, you can't push it too far, you know, because at the moment um, they say, and I believe them, that they're they're fighting and dying against the same enemy as the SAA, basically, which is the, the proxies that that Erdogan's sending in. They're not called Daesh now; they're called you know mm. whatever else they're called. You know the the Syrian National Army, all sorts of things. Um, they're fighting amongst each other in Idlib at the moment too. So. But you have to look at the, the objectives of the, the organ grinders, the people who are calling the shots. And the, it's the US, of course, has used Dash to its, not because they love them, but because they know that they're incredibly divisive, as Churchill said about the Saudis, you know. We, mm, mm. They, they horrify us, but, you know, they're very, they're incredibly loyal to us and we can use them, you know, as a, as a tool against the other people and get their Achilles heel in religion. I think it's important to remember here that, some of those assets that uh, a lot of those assets, particularly at a commander level, they don't really care about at the at the foot soldier level. 
were regularly helicoptered out of the when out of the zones where they were losing, whether it was in Mosul, or whether it was in Deir Ezzur in eastern Syria, they would helicopter them out. You know, so anyone like experienced commanders were capital for them basically, and they've taken a number of them to Afghanistan. Why? Because they're encircling Iran effectively. Mm -hmm. Got Daesh in. Um, to, to some small extent, they've got it in Iran, but Iran's got pretty good secret police, you know. So they're dealing with they're dealing with subversion within Iran. But they've had them in Afghanistan. They've even broken them out of uh, prison in Afghanistan. I don't know if you noticed, it was a year or so ago that some U.S. soldier was killed and in action, and it was to do with the uh, the Taliban breaking uh, Daesh uh, prisoners. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, a group breaking Daesh prisoners out of out of Taliban prison. In other words, even though the Taliban yeah, and, yeah. and Daesh are Islamists, they don't get they don't get along, and the um, the Taliban don't look very kindly on these foreign Islamists coming in and setting up their own flag in Afghanistan. Whatever you say about the Taliban, they are far more indigenous than Daesh yeah. ever was there, basically. So the U.S. has just to add to that, like two months ago. Um, uh, the, it was reported in the media that the Taliban had bombed a hospital, but the Taliban denied it, whereas Daesh took the credit for it. But then the media continued to blame the Taliban. Yeah. And that suggests that maybe it was ISIS. Yeah. So the US, you know, it has got a tool there uh, set up for them by the Saudis with Saudi ideology and acting the way the Saudis do. You know, Daesh is just a little Saudi um, regime, effectively mobile, mobile units. And they haven't got a, a, any big city as a base anymore, but they have, they have shifted them around the region as suits their purpose, basically. And so there's a bit of a resurgence of Daesh in, in Syria at the moment, in mobile bands, of, but they've also got them in Afghanistan, let's remember. And there's another pressure that was preventing Trump against his instincts from withdrawing from Afghanistan. You know, they had some serious talks recently. They knew that they were losing. They've been there for 18 years, or is it 19 years, Nine, almost 19 years? And uh, but they've still got a tool there, which is even though they're, you know, the puppet government only controls Kabul and a few other areas, basically, they've got another tool in there, which is which is ISIS, which is Daesh. Mm, mm, interesting. Whether yeah, I, um, or not the Kurds like it, the US has got a tool that they can use. Yeah, yeah. And it can also it can also be used against them. Um, it can be really used against anyone, right? So um, because they have uh, like a, a, they have this policy that I've noticed, right? What I'm trying to get at is that they will create the problem and then they'll offer themselves as the solution to that problem. Exactly. And it's that's a, like a way it's of... It's a mafia tactic, isn't it? You know, it's a mafia yeah. tactic. You know, you bomb, their, you bomb their buildings, and then you go and you ask for protection, basically. Now, exactly. we, should, we shouldn't forget Israel, of course, in, in all this discussion, basically, because Israel, of course, and this is how you know that there is no future for Rojava or even an independent Kurdistan state in the region. There is no other state in the region for all of the tensions between Turkey and Syria and so on. There is no other state in the region except Israel, which supports the idea of a Kurdish state. And that is to say, an ethnically based state, which is going to have to involve itself in serious ethnic cleansing to create any sort of substantial territory there. Um, so uh, Israel is the other element there. And of course, they've been cheering on um, the, you know the, the the Kurdish nationalist successionary movement, and you have to admit if you you know you're talking about the left, the Western left, and the illusions the Western left has has had. And I agree with you that the Western left or the left liberals have shifted somewhat in the course of a decade because some of them are open to persuasion based on evidence, basically. But it was a similar illusion I recall when I was young about the kibbutzim in in Israel. You know, a lot exactly, of the, yeah. a lot of the Western left really thought that these collective uh, farms farming the desert in Israel were the future of socialism, you know, back in the 70s, let's say, back in the, yeah. maybe the 60s. There's a, there's a quote from Tony Cliff where he said that um, the, the settlers, the kibbutz settlers, they came with a colonizer's gun in one hand and the communist manifesto in the other. And that yes. actually reminds me, that I, I often ask people, give me one argument that you can make for so-called Rojava that you couldn't have also made for Israel back in the 1950s. You know, yeah. it's a socialist, uh, autonomous uh, setup, and yeah. um, and it's made up of people who have been dispossessed of their land or, or massacred or faced extreme persecution elsewhere in another country. So in this case, you know, Europe for the Jews and Turkey for the Kurds. Um, yeah. Is there a similar argument? They're very similar. 
They're Femin very similar Femin states. Feminist socialism. It was in yeah. yeah. that sort of way. Now, Tony Cliff, you mentioned, was, of course, he was a Palestinian uh, Trotskyist or became a Trotskyist. He came from a Zionist family, turned into a left Zionist and went through a process where he effectively didn't think that the, the working class was progressive enough in Palestine or the Arab world. So he ended up in, in Britain. Yeah. But it wasn't just him that was saying that, was it? I noticed the other day looking at um, the Italian Communist Party of the 60s with um, that uh, famous author on liberalism, uh, Lucerdo. Lucerdo. You know? yeah. A lot of the people from the Italian Communist Party in the 60s and 70s had a lot of links with left Zionists or socialists, uh, let's say, yeah, left, left Zionists effectively. And they were influenced by that debate. So, you know, the, the Communist Party in Italy was one of the biggest mass communist parties in Western Europe. They were influenced by those sorts of ideas too. It wasn't just Trotskyists. So I think the idea here in Australia was much more widespread too, that the, the kibbutzes were this socialist experiment and they just ignored the fact that the Palestinian people existed. You know, It was another mm -hmm. terra nullia situation. I actually remember my father who was in the Middle East during the Second World War saying, well, he was told at the time, and he, he wasn't a, a great an political analyst, but he was told as a soldier back mm -hmm. there, um, that the Mufti just led the Palestinian people out into the desert. He, they just voluntarily left. You know, oh, right. They, okay. They, the Jews come along. That's what the Australian government was telling their soldiers back in the 1940s, you know, that the, the, the Palestinian people just up and, and left. There wasn't any ethnic cleansing, basically, you know. So, and, and that really, I think, you know, it probably was not until the 70s that the, the Palestinian movement got a very strong um image in the western world let's say you know that the notion was no there was a people here there was a genuine people here they'd been dispossessed there was ethnic cleansing and you know even even now you know that the documentation of that mm. you know, books like ilan pape's book the ethnic cleansing of palestine and so on these are things of the last few decades you know they, they weren't yeah really and there are parallels. There are some really important parallels when it comes to the the Kurdish situation in northern Syria, but also that 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 contiguous area where there's a large Kurdish population, which is that the reason why they were able to um, establish such demographic dominance, uh, not just in northern Syria but also in southern Turkey, is because of the massacres that have been committed in the past. So if you look at the 19th century, the massacres committed by uh, Badr Khan Beg again against um the the assyrians right and then all of this this the 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 constant massacres against the armenians and the syrians culminating of course in 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 the first world war which is when the big genocide happened against the armenians it completely depopulated areas that were historically comprised of armenians assyrians and arabs and that's how the kurds were able to become a demographic majority and so but they aren't a majority. I mean, I, I think I overestimated it, you know, when I was there last... Not in Syria, in, in Turkey, in, in that region Turkey. generally, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the it's, a, it's a contemporary thing too. The, we talk, you talk about commissionally. I remember, I think it was uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, that uh, someone drew to my attention that in Sydney, here in Sydney, there were 500 families from commissionally that were settling in the outer western part of Sydney, I think around Fairfield there, 500 families from commissionally. That's how many people is that? That's, uh, you know, a few thousand people. Two That's thousand, a, let's say, yeah. It's a, Four it's people, a, a family. It's, it's a village or two. And they will, yeah. we, know, we know that they would have been um, Christians because mm. I think, uh, was it one of the, one of the, was it Malcolm Turnbull that told Donald Trump in one of those phone calls that became public that 80% of the Syrian refugees that were taken in recent years when, when Trump was uh, president were, were Christians, you know. Mm -hmm. In the past, there hadn't been this sort of this sort of uh, distinction based on religion, but apparently most of the Syrian refugees in the last two or three years have been Christians. And so, <clears throat> in a sense, that's been, uh, you know, continuing this process of ethnic cleansing of northeastern Syria and commissionally, which, by the way, nevertheless, there is still now a Syrian army presence and there's a significant... Um, let's say, civil resistance going on there at the moment because the US troops there are not very big. There's only a few hundred, really, but they've got armour, they've got backup, and so there's a, there's a cautious approach to mm. that. There is some armed resistance going on, but there's also an open you know, public rejection uh, and also an open uh, presence of mm. Syrian Russian forces. In, in, in many ways, the refugees, um, the refugee intake has been a part of that problem-solution model because if the, if the problem is that you want to basically divide a country, you want to overthrow the Syrian government and replace it with 
with just uh, warlords and gangs and Wahhabi militias, then you have to provide a solution. And the solution is to say to the minorities, particularly the Christians, hey, look, you can just get up and come to the West. You know, you don't have to live there anymore. And that has the, the, the effect of undermining the state. I remember actually when Aleppo was still occupied by, um, you know, by the gangs um, until late 2016, that there was a there was a double game going on more or less. That um, there were one of the um, one of the archbishops, one of the Orthodox archbishops, was saying, "Look, don't leave Aleppo. We don't want all the Christians to leave Aleppo." I think Canada at that time was taking a lot of uh, Syrian Christians in. Um, so on the one hand, one part of the church was saying, look, we don't want you to depopulate, you know, where you came from, the cradle of Christianity, Syria. But on the other hand, parts of that same church were actually offering assistance to families to, to emigrate to Canada, for example, you know, because of course there was enormous pressure and there was, there was, there was terrible sectarian violence, you know, against, against Christians in Aleppo, you know, so, uh, the, even the, the the churches at that time were in this sort of bind. On one hand, saying we don't want this to happen, we don't want you know to be these traditional areas of 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 the original church to be depopulated. On the other hand, um, they were assisting that immigration too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, uh, uh, just about um, you know how we were talking before. There's one point that I wanted to raise, right? Which is, in terms of the arguments that I've had with uh, with people on the left. Um, some of them, they say, well, you know, the, the, the Kurds, the reason they accepted U.S. Uh, support uh, is because they were they were pinned against the Turkish border by by Islamic State, which is certainly true. Um, I mean, up until 2014, uh, it was the Syrian government that was uh, protecting the, the YPG from from Islamic State. But then once the war got to um, once the once the once ISIS just overwhelmed Eastern Syria and there was no one to protect them, the U.S. stepped in. Um, but it's not just that the YPG um, uh, called in the United States for for defensive reasons. There was also an offensive logic to it as well, which is that once the United States was embedded in northern Syria, they then used that territorial gain as a launch pad to to carry out further aggression against uh, the Syrian government and the Iraqi government. So they shot down planes on two occasions. Syrian planes were shot down. Um, and the, the reason that the U.S. gave on one of those occasions was that they were trying to protect the SDF from the Syrian government, even though the Syrian government were the ones protecting the SDF in the past. So that's the point. Like, you know, on the one hand, if you say, well, you know, it's purely defensive, that's just not true. Um, because, you know, on the other hand, there's, there's an offensive game happening here as well, where the SDF in the United States... Uh, are, are basically launching offensives against the Syrian government. Yeah, the, the U.S. used Daesh as a they cattle prod of them. They they herded them round. Yeah. You can't completely control an armed proxy with full of fanatics. Basically, you can't completely control them and stop them from killing people. But they, if you remember in Iraq, they cattle prodded them away from the Yazidi minorities in the north of Iraq, for example. But they didn't did nothing to stop them going across hundreds of kilometers of deserts to Palmyra, for example, because they wanted them to attack the Syrian army in, in all of those places. Exactly. There was a, a base of Syrian army. So, <clears throat> yeah, they came, they supported the SDF, and then the SDF claims we liberated Mumbij, we liberated this place, that place, you know. Well, yeah, because um, they had a big player. That big player is no longer there, basically. There isn't yeah. the will to keep them there, but there's the will to do damage. I think that's the final sort of point that I'd end up with is that, um, you know, asking uh, one of the intelligence generals in Damascus about this, I said, why do they, you know, what sort of game is Erdogan playing there when he's doing this and doing that? And um, they said, well, you know, you've, even with Erdogan, they regard Erdogan as a puppet of the U.S. effectively. They don't regard him as a significant independent player, even though he has his own ambitions and has his own idea of a Muslim Brotherhood network and so on. But <clears throat> it's happening because the U.S. allows him to do that at, at this stage. And they said, well, um, you know, you, you, you have to look at the big picture there. And the U.S. is losing. It knows it's losing. It knows that we know it's losing and it wants to punish the people on the way out. It wants to do this type of scorched earth operation as it's doing with the economic war, you know, with the Caesar sanctions, which is to punish any third party, you know, assuming that the US has the power to punish anyone in the world. 
for doing business with any sort of business with Syria or with Lebanon or with the groups they don't like in Iraq as well as Iran, of course, you know, they are using a maximum economic warfare to punish. They're not winning. They know that they can't win. So why does someone persist with a conflict when they know that they can't win? To prolong the agony, to prolong their defeat because they can't contemplate losing and to punish the people that have effectively defeated them. And there's the tragedy of the end of this war in, in, in a way like the end of the Vietnam War when they knew they were, they were losing um, in 1968 when the Paris peace talks happened, but they didn't withdraw from Vietnam until 1975. And how many people died between 68 and 75? The millions they invaded yeah. Cambodia in the meantime, Laos, and so on. So that's the tragedy of these long wars where the big power is losing and doesn't want to admit defeat. Indeed. And on that note, I think uh, we can uh, call it a day. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. you. Okay.